us as we sing this song today. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is He. Sing a new song to Him who sits on heaven's earth.
You're the hope to the hopeless. You're the peace to the restless. You are. There is no one like God. church family and welcome to Middleburg United Methodist Church online worship service. This is April 5th and it is also Palm Sunday so if you don't have palm go grab one from somebody's uh, sawgrass palmettos. This is for the passion of Christ. A serious reflection on the scripture references for Palm Sunday remind us that Jesus did not take a leisurely ride to town along a path strewn with palm branches. That first Palm Sunday, he saw the final ride on the high road of principle, obedience, and faith that would lead to the death of Jesus. The disciples may have wished otherwise, but deep in their hearts they must have known that this ride was like no other Jesus had taken and would bring the end of the life they knew as his followers. We can be sure that Jesus knew that the shouts of Hosanna 
would give way to the cry of crucify. He knew because he was fully human and was well acquainted with the temptation to follow the path of political correctness and the easiest way out. He also knew the shouts would change from Hosanna to crucify because he was fully divine and could see clearly that his journey of incarnation was near the end. The coming humiliation and execution were now undeniable. His desire to be faithful was so overwhelmingly strong that he rode on in confidence and ultimate trust in God, whom he knew intimately as Abba. There was no looking back with the question, what if? His focus remained on God and God's will as he moved forward, propelled and sustained by his deep faith in God's goodness and love. Palm Sunday invites us to search deeply in our own souls for the answer to the question, what words would have been on my lips that day? This day also invites us to consider our own course for today and tomorrow. We too can move forward in obedience and faith as we place our ultimate trust in God who has been made known to us in Jesus Christ. The peace and confidence of Jesus can be ours as we place our ultimate trust in God. Amen. Good morning, everyone, and happy Palm Sunday. The choir is going to present Jesus is the Living Stone. <clears throat>
Book of Luke, chapter 19, verses 28 through 34. After Jesus has said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethpage and Bethany, at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you. As you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why, tell him the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying my dog? The Lord needs it. Can we see for all of them? Yes. church family, it's that time in our service where we would like to devote our tithes and offerings to our Heavenly Father. Um, if you would please pray with me. Holy God, sovereign over power and pain, glorious triumph and deep disappointment, we enter this holy week bringing our tithes and offerings to your altar and leaving them here in the hope you will send them to make the world a more loving and compassionate place. We are reminded through the scripture that you sent two of your disciples out to make the world ready for your coming. Go into the village, find the donkey, tell them the Lord has need. Remind us that your kingdom breaks into the world not as a spectacle for us to witness, but as a parade where we are called to make a working contribution. We pray in the name of the one who comes not just for the parade, but for the cross at the end of it. Amen. Hello and good, good morning, church. Welcome to worship via the internet again. This is our second, third, this will be our third Sunday together this way. So thank you for joining us and thank you for sharing these videos and helping others find how to navigate and get online. It's, it's important that we can connect as a community in times such as this. So let us pick up this morning. I know hopefully you've seen the choir's anthem, you've seen the youth and the children's videos. And if you have not yet, I would ask you to click around, see that stuff and then come back to me. I love what they, the children will give you the, the Palm Sunday reading in, in theatrics, if you will. Uh, I'm going to give you the passion part, or, and this will be the epistle from uh, Paul, but I want to take it to a different place. So here's a reading, it's from Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love. Being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, regard others as better than yourself. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, 
but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Verse 9, Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of, say it with me, Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And this is the reading of God's Word, the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Praise be to God. Amen. So we looked at the Palm Sunday narrative with our children. And now I want to give you some of Paul's words. We looked at Jesus and we re-stepped his journey with the disciples from the Last Supper uh, to the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, to the Temple Mount, and uh, around that area, Caiaphas's house, as he was arrested and sort of put in a little dungeon prison, uh, to, to where we're going with the cross. We looked at sacrifice, we looked at uh, redemption and restoration. And I want to bring that all back together with what I think the Apostle Paul is trying to do for the church. And this is the church at Philippi, which have been in uh, Macedonia in Paul's uh, days. But I think it's interesting where Paul is writing from, uh, spiritually speaking, emotionally speaking, but particularly physically speaking, because he's imprisoned. He would probably been on what we consider a house arrest in Rome. So uh, you could say, in today's vernacular, <laughs> Paul's on. Paul is quarantined. And so he, he's probably getting a little stir crazy like some of you during this, this time. But look what he did and look what he does with the time that he does have. And under such uh, hard circumstances, if you will, he writes a, a sort of a love letter, a letter of thanks and a letter of encouragement. And I love what he's doing here. Uh, I want to ask you, inside of this text is the call to imitate Christ. So that, that leads me to, to ask a question. How good am I at anything? Am I an expert in anything at all? A professional of anything at all? And, and if I could list anything, and, and, and if you knew me well enough, you'd probably say, no. Nope. And I, I don't know if you are. And if you are an expert or professional in your field, that's wonderful. But here's what I want to know is, can we as Christians truly imitate Christ? Well, I want to try. I want to be 100% faithful, just like I think you desire to be as well. So anyway, what I want to see here is that Paul is encouraging a church that was supportive of his ministry, a church that was doing things that God would have them do. They, in turn, need to receive some encouragement and some support and some guidance. And so Paul is saying, you know what? If there's any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. So Paul's not happy, I'm sure, that he's under house arrest, but he has joy. And his joy would be complete if the church could live this way. Now, this church was training, just like we are, and they're working toward their righteousness and holiness. But I wonder uh, if we look at musicians, uh, athletes, and others that we think are pros and experts, maybe those we model our lives after, we, we uh, idolize, could we say that they were ever experts or professionals on their own? No, I don't think we can say that. But I think we can say that they're a part of a community. Uh, musicians are part of the music community. Athletes part of an athletic community that supports them, that guides them, that trains them, that coaches them, encourages them, and maybe even prays for them. Point being, nobody gets where they are without a little help from somebody else. And Paul knew that. The church knows that, knew it. And now we come back together as another one of God's communities to see what is it that we should be doing right now? What is it that I should be learning, particularly right now from this text? And how is this relatable in the 21st century? Well, one, 
like Paul. We're not with the people we love. We would love to be together right now, worshiping together, having that passing the peace time and holding hands during our benediction as we sing, blessed be the tie that binds, but it's not the case. We're going to have to do things a little differently as a community. So let's, I asked Dr. Google what a community was, and this is what he said, or it said, a group of people living in the same place or having a particular characteristic in common. Or, second definition, a feeling of fellowship with others as a result of sharing common attitudes, interests, and goals. So you think about others in our church congregation, uh, those that we're in ministry with, do you, do you sense that common bond? And if you're in a group, small group, Bible study, or church, you don't sense that, well, like all these other churches that receive letters, we, <laughs> we may need a letter of our own. And there's lots of warnings in this regard, especially as we get to the end of the story and see how God views churches that are stagnant or lukewarm but for now we certainly see here that we're to be a community of love we're to be a community and we're to be a community of love uh, and i believe this connects with what moses was doing as god was leading him and making the whole nation of israel he says you'll be a kingdom of priests a holy nation right may have said that backwards but you get the point that's who we are. We're doing it together with God's help, filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I believe myself, you, and those around you are some, at somewhat different levels of our spirituality, meaning like even our experiences with these, these stories, the movements of Christ, etc., etc. But that being said, we're all over the place in our growth, in our experience, in our maturity. So I, I think it's important to say nobody stumbles into Christian maturity. And nobody gets to Christian maturity on their own. No, we need each other. I mean, how often is the Bible studied diligently, right? Without the aid of some sort of scholars or professors. Somebody who's been in it a little longer, wrestled with it a little more uh, passionately and with more time to learn these principles and ideas. And I think we do. We need that. But in today's epistle text, Paul offers a little more, too. I, I love how it gets on the practical level. And you can look at this as like survival guides <laughs> or just some uh, godly principles to live by. But what he's doing is saying there are some, certain things that make a community and there are certain things that break a community. And now we're speaking about a faith community, so this, the, the same is absolutely true. Paul is saying... What makes us and breaks us is harmony, unity, fellowship, self-sacrifice. And where, where do we get that from? Harmony, unity, and self-sacrifice. We look to Jesus, just like Paul is doing here and asking the Philippians to. So if there's harmony, and I would add some humility, that would equal unity. So what else is he, he, so we look at the virtue of harmony and humility. He uses words like comfort and consolation, agape for love, koinonia for fellowship, an overarching devotion to putting on and living out the mind of Christ. So there are forces that make uh, a community and make it unified and holy. But there's also things that can break a faith community. What about these uh, seeds of dissension, discord, planted by the vices of our self, self-ambition, our own agendas? Uh, and, and, and those things are what Paul is referring to, selfish ambition, vain glory or empty glory. Two forces that can break a community. And so where do we see that stuff? In our own life? In others? And, and we need to rebuke that and, and pray for our own selves and for those in our community. 
In verse 8, it's saying, Jesus humbled Himself and became obedient to the point of death. So this causes me to pause and reflect on my level of obedience. I don't know that I could say if I were in Jesus' shoes, I would fulfill the mission. I would like to say that I would have based on uh, my faith and trust in God, and, but I don't know how I could really answer it. Even my obedience uh, it today, in today's context, would be found wanting, lack. So we train and we practice because Christ has given us the ultimate example. And I think Christ should be our head, just like we learn from Scripture. And we should be the body. So we should have the mind of Christ. Let Christ think for us and we think like Christ. And, and we know how Christ thought by looking at His life, looking at what He said, looking and reading the stories, how He interacted with people. And Jesus, as He was being beaten, didn't curse anyone. As He was being spat upon, He didn't spit back. As He was hit, He didn't hit back. And even on the cross, as He's brutally hung and hanging in agony, dying to catch a breath, He says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's who we look to. That's who we're following. And that will not, that kind of humility, sacrifice, will only bring harmony and unity. So Jesus humbles Himself that He became obedient. Obedience is our goal. Certainly the Philippians were threatened by other external forces, but they had to stop and, and reflect and, and look inwardly at their own selves. This is a word to individuals as well as a community. Checking my own level of obedience, my own uh, humility, my own discord, where, where I contribute to the lack of harmony and unity. And so we pause to think of that. And it's why Paul is imploring this church to take on the identity of Christ. You know, I want you to, when you see me, you don't see me, you don't hear me, my prayer every before every Sunday. This is a Thursday <laughs> camera recording. But it's always my prayer that when you see me, you see Christ. When you hear me, you hear Christ. And that's the Holy Spirit's job, and I'm going to trust the Holy Spirit to do His work. But because we want the mind of Christ, we want a Christian identity. And this is how we do it. And we look to the identity of Christ, and we know from other places in Scripture that God the Father is love. What's more powerful than that? What could stop a community motivated by love? We just finished our food bridge. Distribution ministry currently is a drive-by, drive-through uh, service. And it works, and it's worked the last three weeks. And I'm proud to say uh, our church is doing fabulous ministry. We're, we're under the, the orders of being careful, of course, and social distancing. But we've not let it stop us from loving each other and loving people the way the church should. And Paul's not letting imprisonment stop him from sharing the word as he should. And the Philippians, in whatever circumstance they had been in and will be in, they need to know this stuff. And that's what Paul's trying to do. He's saying, you need more love, need more compassion, need more humility. That's powerful stuff. That's God's way of flipping the script, right? It's that upside down gospel. It just doesn't make sense to the world, to the Romans. It's no, we want, to, we want power with a heavy hand, right? Force people into obedience and like-mindedness. But that's not God's way at all. If our mission is love, if our purpose is love, we don't have to worry about all these other things, that these competing forces, competing with one another, worrying about being one-upped, looking good and all this stuff. No. Don't have an agenda. There was a, a, a great illustration I wanted to uh, share. This is a, from a, another Methodist pastor. Uh, this, this guy's in uh, Virginia, 
Alexandria, Virginia. His name is Howard Satterwhite. So he's comparing the ideal of Christian community of love with a marriage in which the romance has faded. The honeymoon is over and the relationship has become a labor of love requiring simple tenacity. Just hanging in there. Describing his vision of Christian love at close quarters, he said, we should lose the illusions of perfection. If we're looking for perfection here, we had better go somewhere else. But no one else has it either. We need to deal with the fact that we are imperfect and yet are in love as a community. The community cannot save us from anything and we cannot save anyone else. Not on our own skills and not on our charms. But trusting in God, he says, we become more trustworthy to each other and more available for the authentic community that is grounded in God's power and not our own. So how are we going to make this work? How are we going to live into this resurrection power that we're going to celebrate very soon that we have not lost? We're still celebrating a little Easter even today, this morning, as we share and worship together. But now something very powerful has entered our midst. It's causing us to consider our level of love, love of God, love of one another, which sort of takes on the, the cross pattern. How can I be rightly related to God, right? First four commandments and then the, the others, how we can be in right relationship as a community of faith with one another. And so I just want to close by um, saying we all want reconciliation. We all want love. But this is, it's, it's hard stuff. It takes, it takes effort. It takes both parties at work, meaning the church, with one another and with God, ourselves with one another and ourselves to God. We know when there's reconciliation, a community can truly be in harmony and unified. Well, this one particular uh, family, it was a husband and wife, and the, the husband, it had been a, one of those weekends where they fought the whole time and they were now not talking. It was Sunday night and the husband had this real important uh, meeting to get to and he needed to catch a flight. But not speaking to his wife, he didn't, he was afraid to communicate, afraid to talk, afraid to say I'm sorry, all that other stuff that should go with this. He writes on a little piece of paper, flight tomorrow, please wake me up 5 a.m. Puts it over on a nightstand near her. Well, he gets up in the morning and it's 9 a.m. He's missed his flight and he is furious. Well, he's looking for his wife. He goes through the house, through the kitchen. He doesn't see her. He's going to give her the business, you know. And he, he, he gets back into the bedroom and he notices after he moved the covers around, he threw this little note and he picks it up and reads it. And she had written on the note, it's 5 o'clock, wake up. It's funny. It's a weird way to communicate. It wasn't very helpful on either side, right, of that argument. And we're just as guilty of doing silly things, trying to communicate when we're unhealthy, when there's unforgiveness, when there's bitterness because we've been hurt or betrayed or abandoned, isolated. All these things that the enemy can use to really destroy and defeat us. So we're coming against that stuff. Uh, in this circumstance, situation, our identity is Christ, so we can take on the mind of Christ and we can also have the peace of Christ. And that's all because of a sacrifice on an old rugged cross, right? And the person that wrote that song, George Bernard, in the late 1800s and he died in 1937, I think it was, he walked 15 miles to a Salvation Army uh, meeting, uh, a service. And there he gave his life to Christ, found a better way to live, and later penned those words to put pen to paper on what we beloved, know as a beloved treasure of him writing, the old rugged cross, right? Uh, it's stained by blood divine, but why for you, for me, that we might be in relationship with God the Father the right way, 
And then you know, Old Testament times, it required sacrifice, a lamb. Jesus has become that lamb who will take away the sins of the world. We're going to get back to that and celebrate that this morning with the ultimate expression of God's love and grace as Jesus laid down His life willingly for us. We come again to experience it. We come again to immerse ourselves in the middle of what God is doing in our community, in our lives, just like from the very last supper, last supper with His disciples, to each one we have every month, every week for some of us. It's a reconnecting with God through Christ, receiving that grace again. Even reconnecting with our baptism, receiving forgiveness and extending that to others. But you'll hear that invitation and be recalled back to that place. But for now, hear these words that Jesus is madly in love with you. You are His creation and He loves you just the way you are. But we have to all confess and admit that we have not loved God with our whole heart, right? We're going to confess that in a minute, but... Let's just be honest with ourselves and God and see where we might be in the Philippian church. We might receive some encouragement from Paul this morning. I pray you have. And I pray you will encourage those around you. Love your family during this time like you never have before. Do some fun things together. Challenge one another. But above all, love one another. And I would also ask that one way we can stay connected is that you maybe comment, email, uh, particularly on the thread with the video, it might be good to post what God's doing in your life. And then we can stay connected. But for now, may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the sweet communion of His Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you and your families as through the video you might receive Peace today and hereafter. Amen. Welcome back, church. Now we'll celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion together. Uh, we don't have our page 12 together, so I'll do a, a little extemporaneous uh, piece that invites you, as it does every month, every week, every time to live at peace with God the Father and with one another. And if you earnestly seek to do that, you're invited. Uh, you may want to pause the video though. You will need a piece of bread and if you have some grape juice, that would be great. If not, whatever liquid you can find. Uh, and I'll, I'll definitely show this off while I have a chance. We have a wonderful baker in our church. So Christ our Lord invites to His table all who love Him and earnestly seek to live at peace with God and one another. So we find ourselves as those people, but to approach a holy God appropriately, we need to confess our sin. So let us take a moment to pause and pray to God. If we were saying this together, our repentance might sound like, Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ, our Lord Jesus, died for us while we were yet sinners. And Paul picked up on that in Romans, right? So, uh, in the name of Jesus, you are forgiven. And you said it, in the name of Jesus, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. And then there's a piece for offering. So I just want to thank you as a church for continuing to give through these times. And I would ask uh, and pray that you would continue to. So now might be a time to pause and get the app out, make a donation, or get your checkbook out, make, get, write your tithe, or anything above and beyond that. We would certainly love and can put to good use here as we are certainly struggling like 
everyone else during this time to, to, to keep our things <laughs> in the way that we love to enjoy them. So let us do that now and then we'll return. Now you remember, we reconnect in this moment with the story. Jesus is having his last supper with the disciples. Now the bread, if it looked like a cross in his day, that would be real interesting. But he takes the bread. He breaks it. Gives thanks to God the Father. Blesses it and gives it to his disciples saying, this is my body broken for you. Take it. Eat it. Remember me. Likewise, after the supper, Jesus takes the cup, gives thanks to God the Father, offers it to His disciples, saying, This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take it, drink from it, and as often as you do, remember me. So we are here to recollect. We are here to cognitively think and remember, but not just a story from the past. No, 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 no. We cooperate now with God's grace presently. And we also look forward, right, to a day where we'll feast at God's heavenly banquet with all those who've gone before us. So today brings together past, present, and future, as we remember. So I would ask now, that Lord, you pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and juice. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by His blood. By Your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at His heavenly banquet. Through Your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in Your holy church, all honor and glory is Yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. We pray with me the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You've been invited. You've confessed your sins. I would ask you now to partake of the elements that, that, that have been consecrated even through the video. Remember, as you take your elements, this is the body of Christ broken for you. And as you taste the juice, the wine, the grapes, remember that this is Christ's blood shed for you. And together we feast on Him in our hearts, right? With faith and love. Good stuff, isn't it? May God bless you and your home today. May you find peace in your house and amongst yourselves and your neighbors and your community. And above all, let's be the community God's called us to be. Community of love. Amen? So church, let's enter into a prayer time together. I know there are lots that we're dealing with. There are things on our hearts and minds that we, we want, we desire to take to the Lord's presence. So let's call to mind those things, those people, places, as we prepare to play, uh, pray together. Maybe you even want to call them out. That's what we're bringing to you today, Lord. Let us pray. We are so thankful, God, that none of this has caught you by surprise. The situation, the season, the predicament we find ourselves in is very interesting, it's new, for most of us, so I pray, O oh God, that like everything else, we be led by You and Your grace.
Come Holy Spirit and feel and inspire Your people. Lead us, O oh God. Be with our nation's leaders and the, the, the leaders all around the world. Help us to work together, to be unified, to find uh, cures, not only for this coronavirus, but for any and all others that would come our way. But ultimately, in Jesus, You've cured us, given us salvation freely through Christ's sacrifice. So thank You, Jesus, for forgiveness, for Your sacrifice, and for giving us the example of how to love God and love one another. You've given us a lot to live up to and to live into. So we want to take on your mind and your very identity. Will you come into our space, our sphere of influence even, and work miracles? Where there is sickness, oh God, bring healing. Where there is pain, Bring relief. Where there is sorrow, O oh Lord, bring hope. For there are many in our midst grieving the loss of loved ones. May you comfort them, O oh God. May they feel the love of this prayer which represents your love and the love of the church. And above all else, Lord, as individual disciples, find us faithful. We pray these things in the name of the one who gave his life for us and never stopped loving us and loves us even now. Thank you for mercy, for giving us and never forsaking us for redemption and reconciliation. We thank you, O oh Lord, for this, this place you're leading us through. And Lord, we'll be careful in this and all things to give you the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.